I hope not. I'm just hoping I get done in time. Um, some really good stuff here today. And I have a lot of notes. So I'm hoping that everything works. We are going to be talking about fighting the A-team. Going to be talking about fighting the good fight, though. We are up. All right. Mine's not. Oh, there we go. All righty. We're going to start, and I, I added more than what the lesson had here because it just seemed like I should keep going on it. Starting in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the tricks and the deceit and everything. You know, that's the way the devil works. He doesn't really have, he can't make you do anything, but he can fool you into doing things. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And from my understanding, wrestle here didn't mean just, just a slight tussle. This was one of those fights to the death type of wrestling. Wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare holding faith and a good conscience, which some, have, uh, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. And we'll mention this again later. And then in 1 Timothy 6, verses 11 and 12, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. And then 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So we are in a fight, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, back during World War II, Sergeant Joan Mortimer, Flight Officer Elspeth Henderson, and Sergeant Helen Turner were all members of Britain's um, Women's Auxiliary Air Force uh, during World War II. And on September the 1st, don't know what year it was, but they, they reported their posts when the German Luftwaffe was making an uh, air attack um, during the Battle of Britain. And, but they stayed at their posts throughout the bombing. Officer Henderson's operations room took a direct hit but she got up off the floor, back to work, and kept going. Sergeant Turner stayed at the switchboard while the bombs were falling, and Sergeant Mortimer worked in the armory when the raid started. And even with the bombs exploding around her, she got a, a bundle of red flags together and went out and started marking all the unexploded uh, bombs that were hitting. Um, I guess the Germans made really good bombs. But it might have seemed safer to just hunker down and seek shelter. But they remembered what all soldiers have to remember, we're at war. And, you know, we, we enjoy worship in a real comfortable atmosphere. And it's, we, we have to remember, this is more like a celebration than a battle, but we are at war. Um, the Apostle Paul reminded us to suit up daily with the whole armor of God, march on our knees, fight for our souls and for other souls. Now, at times, maybe these women felt that, that they, were, they were fighting an unwinnable battle. But in May of 1945, they and the Allies won the war. And when we hear of terrorism and school shootings, uh, drug addiction, pornography, and all the stuff that's going on in the world, and how um, evil is trying to just take over, sometimes maybe it feels like we're waging an unwin uh, unwinnable battles. But God is fighting for us. The church is fighting with us, and through God's spirit and our unity and all the other, everything, we will, we will win our battles, and we will eventually win the war. But 
by the grace of God, we will win. Actually, God will win. We just have to make sure we stay on his side. And we can't just let him do it all, and we just sit back and say, well, God's got this under control. There's been a lot of evil perpetrated in the world that I don't necessarily think was God's will, but people make their own decisions. Uh, scripture offers a very, uh, various perspectives on the Christian life, and some of the biblical metaphors that we talk about are being kings and priests, family, royal priesthood, chosen generation, vine and branches, fishermen, uh, family, sheep, household of faith, the body, kingdom, all these kind of things. But one that calls up images of struggle as well as potential victory is the Christian life is a war. I think we've been a long time since we mentioned it, but, you know, this is not a cruise ship. It's a battleship. You know, the old ship of Zion? No, it's not, it's not a cruise ship. But there is an enemy, and we do have weapons. And these weapons, if we use them wisely and faithfully, assure us that we are going to win. There is going to be a victory. We are going to come out victorious. But if their weapons are not used appropriately, defeat is certain. Because you can't just leave, leave the weapons laying around there and just stand up and try to fight on your own. The devil is a little too smart for that. He's been at this for thousands of years, and he knows people. And the best thing you can do is keep the devil in the dark about what, you, what you're thinking. Don't let on. Don't give him any inclination, uh, any um, information that you broadcast that this is how I feel or this is what's bugging me or this is what's attacking me or this is what's affecting me because then he knows this works. I've told people that before. They, well, I stayed home because of this. Well, the devil knows that works. So expect that to happen again and again and again and again. <coughs> Another thing, if the weapon isn't correctly identified, defeat is more likely. Um, well, it was at men's, men's, con, uh, men's uh, retreat several years back when Brother uh, Jeff Morgan preached. Talked about if, you, if you're going, if you're just going hunting for rabbits, you're going to take a little 22. If you're going hunting for bears, you're going to take something a whole lot bigger. But when you don't know what you're going to face, you don't know what to take. And this is, this is how it is with the devil. If you don't know what you're facing, if you don't know what to look for, how do you prevent it? How do you uh, prevent the attack? How do you defend yourself? But um, if, if you don't, if you can't correctly identify the enemy, where he's coming from, what he's doing, like Paul said, you're going you're gonna to be beating the air. You're just going to be fighting where the enemy's not. You're going to be fighting the wrong thing. You're going to be fighting people who aren't the enemy. But um, when you do that, you give the enemy an attack, uh, an uh, um, opportunity to ambush you and when you weren't expecting anything. But the war consists of major and minor battles. And for that reason, we have to stay constantly alert because spiritual defeat may seem minor when something happens. Well, that was just a little slip up. It's not, it can end up being fatal in the end. You know, you can be killed by infection just as well as you can being blown apart. So, is warfare ever a good thing? Well, yeah unless you just want to serve anyone who comes along. But especially if it's spiritual warfare, it's a good thing. You know, we can't practice spiritual pacifism. In other words, just peace, bro. That's not, that's by the way, that's two pieces. Um, and there's no such thing as neutrality. You can't just say, well, I, I'm, I'm neutral. No, you just picked a side. Anyone remember the saying, the only necessary thing for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing? Evil isn't a pacifist. Our enemy is not a pacifist. 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, your enemy, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking, he's not a pacifist, he's out there working, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist? Maybe he's saying, you resist him. In other words, stand against him. Steadfast, which is solid and stable, in the faith. 
Now, James shares the same warning to resist the devil in James 4 and 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But we need to note that both of them, before given this warning, refer to the Greek translation, from the, which is the, the um, Septuagint of Proverbs 3 and 34. Both of them said in verses prior to this, the Lord resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So they both tied the ability to resist the devil to submission to God. Quit trying to think you can do it on your own. So be sober, sobriety. Now Peter advised sobriety by use of the same Greek word in 1 Peter 1, verses 13, and, and uh, in, actually in 4 and 7. And the word refers to, and this is according to, we'll call it bag D, rather than saying Bauer, Arndt, Gingrich, and Danker, Greek, English lexicon. Um, but they said the word refers to freedom from every form of mental and spiritual drunkenness. From excess, passion, rashness, confusion. The word vigilant. Um, this Greek word that this comes from appears frequently in the New Testament. Commonly translated with some form of watch. Again, from bag D, the figurative meaning is to be on the alert, be watchful. In other words, keep your eyes open. So sobriety, conceptually, is connected with the humility of 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. To humble yourself under the mighty hand of God is an act of sobriety. It represents clear thinking to recognize and realize that our complete dependence on God and to cast all our cares upon him is, is where the answer is going to come from. We can't do it on our own. Um, vigilance is conceptually linked with resisting the devil and being steadfast in the faith. Now, if you look at the context of Peter's warning in verses 5 and 7, submission, being subject one to another, being clothed with humility, humbling yourselves, casting all your cares on God because he cares for you, this context indicates that one of the ways the devil seeks to devour believers is by persuading them to live unsubmitted lives. Self-centered lives, independent lives. These types of lives are characterized by worry and lack of trust in God. Because anybody with half a brain knows you can't stand up against an adversary that's thousands of years old and has been doing this for thousands of years. We only have that much experience. So be clear-minded. This is, this is, this is going to be my, my rendition of 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9. Be clear-minded, watchful, and alert, because your enemy, the devil, is walking around like a roaring lion, actively, purposefully looking for someone to devour. But stand against him, solid and stable in the faith. Now, I don't usually stop and do questions, but I just want us to consider something here. As you examine your own successes or failures in spiritual warfare, which of Paul's two key words best describes the practices you should further develop or work on? Should you be more sober-minded? Or should you be more vigilant or both? Being clear-minded, have you been maybe too caught up in daily living and carnality or even frivolity to make sound decisions? Have you been watchful or maybe you didn't notice the enemy's presence in time and he was already doing damage before you realized the danger? That's something that we need to, we need to be aware of. So the right response to the devil is to resist him from a position of submission to God and steadfast faith and to keep in mind that the sufferings of believers anywhere aren't unique. You aren't the Lone Ranger. This is not the only time this has ever happened. This is not, you're not the only one that's ever faced certain trials, um, or persecution, or whatever. These are typical of the sufferings of believers somewhere else. Now, we are not being beheaded and burned alive and all that kind of stuff like some of the past and somewhere in other places in the world even today. But we are facing other things, and the devil doesn't necessarily need to kill you. He just doesn't want you serving God. So, 
The New Testament mentions the conscience 30 times. The Greek word translated conscience refers to moral awareness. And so if we look at the uses of this word, we see at least five different types or kinds of consciences. Now, we're talking about kinds, not conditions. So we're going to go through these and remember that this is a... Uh, this is not like conditions, uh, like a clear conscience or a guilty conscience or something like that. But we're talking about the biblical things that they, they list here. Okay, the first one is a weak conscience. This is the victim of incorrect information. And this, this kind of conscience, it's, it's information, it's instincts don't fit reality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7, 9, 10, and 12. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. But their conscience and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. And being, and take heed lest by any man's this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see that which thou hast knowledge, see which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's um, temple, shall not the conscience of him that is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Then in Romans 14 and 2, for one believeth that he may eat all things, another is weak, eateth herbs. So there's, there's one, a weak conscience, and I, I guess this would be one of those people that Brother, Brother uh, Arnold has talked about, said they don't believe they, they don't believe in anything but fresh air. Everything is a sin, and they're, they're just so careful not to do anything, touch anything, eat anything. Everything's, you know, there are people that feel guilty if they're not fasting or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, a wounded conscience, this happens when a stronger brother flaunts his liberty before a weaker brother, causing the weaker one to participate in behavior for which his weak conscience condemns him. And this is the same scriptures we just... This is the other side of the same story. Um, again, from 1 Corinthians 8 and then for, uh, Romans 14, uh, actually verses 22 and 23. Hast thou faith? Have it by thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If God has convicted you over something or you've stopped something, just don't do it. And if somebody else has an issue with it, don't do it in front of them. Now, that's not mean go home and get drunk because nobody's around. That's bad, just in case you didn't know that. Getting drunk is not, not good. Burned out or a seared conscience. A person with a burned out conscience has to... Cons has consistently resisted his inner standards that the normal pain that conscience produces when you do something uh, is no longer there. You can do stuff that you used to not believe in, and it's like, eh. Now, to me, this is confusing with the person with a weak conscience. And I'm wondering if the first two back and forth, don't create the third. First Timothy 4, 1 and 2, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Of course, that's what searing is. An evil conscience in Hebrews 10, 22 let us draw near to God, of course, one with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, in, in Brother Seagrave's book, um, Hebrews Better Things, Volume 2, <clears throat> he said, having our hearts sprinkled is obviously a symbolic way of saying our sins are forgiven. In this context, having our bodies washed means the same thing. In light of the emphasis in Hebrews on the law as symbol for new covenant realities, there may be an allusion here to the ritual washing of the priests in the laver. But what their washing merely symbolized has been accomplished by the blood of Jesus. Then he said, in the context 
An evil conscience is one that is not cleansed from sin and continually reminds a person of his sinfulness. It's a conscience that relies on the law of Moses or anything other than the blood of Jesus to deal with sin and to gain access to the presence of God. In other words, you, you earn your way into it. Now, I agree with Brother Seagraves, Dr. Seagraves, that our bodies washed with water does not refer to baptism because being washing our bodies has nothing to do with baptism, and pure water has nothing to do with baptism. So I think he's right on that, that this did not... This did not mean baptism. And then we come to good conscience. This is a conscience that's well informed by scriptural truth, so it has biblical instincts. It relies on the, it relies on the Bible and what does the Bible say rather than, well, so-and-so does it, so it must be wrong, or so-and-so does it, so it must be right. Acts 23 and 1, and Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Chapter 24 and verse 16, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. In Romans 13 and 5, talked in submission, Wherefore ye must needs be subject or submitted, not only for wrath, in other words to prevent punishment, but also for conscience sake. Do the right thing so your conscience doesn't bother you, not because you're going to stay out of trouble over it. Because there are times when you may not get in trouble for it, but you still shouldn't do it. 2 Corinthians 1 and 12, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. 1 Timothy 1, 5 and 7 5 to 7. Now, the end of the commandment is, is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. In verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, of, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Chapter 3 and verse 9, talking about the qualifications of a deacon, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Again, is his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 and 3. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Hebrews 13 and 18. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience and all things willing to live honestly. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is, with, that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Verse 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Only the good conscience is helpful in a spiritual war. Spiritual warfare, a good conscience is what's going to help you help you get through. Any other is going to just kind of complicate the battles, and you're going to be fighting things that you don't need to. So as you think about the five consciences, where are you? What are you having good time with, a bad time with? What's easy, what's hard? Where do you, where do you fit in there? Those who don't hold faith with a good conscience will make shipwreck. That's one of our first scriptures up there. Paul offered Hymenaeus and Alexander as examples. He delivered them unto Satan. In 1 Timothy 1 and 20, he says, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And according to 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18, the error of Hymenaeus, along with Philetus in this case, was to say the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. And this is where I, I think it's a, it's a moot point when people argue about when is the rapture going to take place before the tribulation in the middle of the tribulation at the end of the tribulation doesn't matter if you're ready to go now if you see the antichrist come on the scene well guess what he didn't come before it and if there's all kinds of persecution going on and everything well that's just the way it goes but be ready to go today so Alexander was probably the coppersmith 
that Paul mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, chapter, uh, verses 14 and 15, who did Paul much evil and greatly withstood his words, is the way he put it. So while we don't know exactly what Paul's words that he rejected, we don't know what they were, Paul described his sin and that of Hymenius as blasphemy, which means to speak evil of something or someone. Now, to say, you know, uh, so-and-so was late to church, I don't think that's blaspheming that person. But when you start talking evil about the things of God, yeah, the man of God, the word of God, God's moving in the, in, the, in the church, his spirit, and you speak evil about that, yeah, that, that comes under blasphemy. So by speaking evil of Paul's inspired words, they both lost their faith and no longer had a good conscience. Their conscience was not well informed by scriptural truths, and they didn't have biblical instincts anymore. They were just kind of out there on their own. So, is there such a thing as a good fight? Uh, yes, especially if it's a fight of faith, just like a good war. You don't just let the enemy come in and take over, you fight back. Um, this fight lays hold on eternal life, First Timothy 6 and 12. Where there is no fight, eternal life slips away because the enemy comes in and takes over. So how do we fight this battle? Well, first we flee the things that distract us as our enemy does his work. Specific thing, the specific things that Paul had in mind precede his admonition of Timothy. And so this is, we go back to verse, uh, 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse 6. But godliness and contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us, therewith, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many false and, and uh, foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So, <clears throat> you know, these actions might seem kind of minor in uh, the arena of spiritual warfare, but they're powerfully effective. Contentment protects a person from a lot of things like jealousy, envy, and greed. You got what you got. If you, if you better yourself and you get a raise and everything, good. And I don't remember who it was it, because the Times or Conference or somewhere, I think it was Brother Huntley, he says maybe God, God raises your, your standard, your, your income and gives you more. Not necessarily so you can raise your standard of living, but your standard of giving. And when God can trust you with this much, he'll give you some more. And he'll give you some more. Contentment is what we need. Those whose goal is riches, they weaken their resistance to temptation and they step into a snare. They start finding other ways to get what they're after. Um... Many whose riches enable them to afford to people get the riches, and this gives them a way that they can indulge in things that they shouldn't indulge in. They uh, indulge in their weaknesses, and they fail. To covet money is to blunder, stumble from faith, resulting in a range of sorrowful trouble they would not otherwise have experienced. So let's just be happy with what we got. There are other things to flee, but many of them fall into the categories of his admonition about discontentment. Um, I mean, how many people here think all your problems would be solved if you had more money? Well, some of them would. And you may have more, more issues with the money than you had without the money. I can tell you, you'll have a lot more friends, needy ones that want what you have. I can tell you right now, if, if anybody was to win a lottery or something like that, people show up from everywhere wanting some. I don't remember who it was, some one of the wealthiest in the world. I don't know if it was a Rothschild or Rockefeller or somebody. 
and they were interviewing them. They said, so how much is enough? And they said, just a little bit more. Never happy. How many millionaires have committed suicide? Money doesn't do it. So, remember, first, we flee the things that distract us. Second, in our effort to lay hold on eternal life is to follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. That was verse 11. Now, 6 to 10 set the thing up and then said, okay, here we go. The word translated follow describes vigorous pursuit. This is not just a meander along in the same, same direction. It's not just a trail after something, just a dawdle, but this is the actual vigorous pursuit, like you're hunting after, you're pursuing. Um, the use of this word is especially appropriate for the idea of warfare. Victory requires aggressive effort to find and capture for oneself the qualities of righteousness, right living. Righteousness here is not imputed righteousness that believers have by faith from Romans chapter 4. But it's a personal and practical righteousness manifested by a separated lifestyle and sanctified attitudes. And there's some scriptures here too. If you, if you want them, I can give them to you later. It includes imitating the character of God and manifesting spiritual fruit as described in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And this is from Brother Enzi's book on the pastoral epistles which is 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus. Reverence for God, godliness. Same word is translated holiness. Um, there, are, there are a couple of them. 2150 is the number if you have a Strong's and 2317. We're not talking about 2317. We're talking about the other one, 2150. Well, then you've got faith or trust in God, love, this is agape love. This is not phileo love. This is not eros or whatever, but agape love. Patience and patience here. And I went, when I, I taught on, uh, oh, I don't remember. I think it's Second Peter. When it uh, talks about being, being glad when you fall in diverse temptations, that patience that he talks about is, is what we're talking about here, a cheerful endurance. Not, oh, brother, I, I got this, I got that, I just can't stand it. I'm so, you know, that's not patience. You're a whiner. Okay, you got to, okay, guess what? If the devil can't beat you down with it, he's going to quit doing it. And then humility, meekness. These qualities diametrically oppose the discontentment and greed that Paul warned Timothy against. So, as you consider the qualities we're to pursue to lay hold on eternal life, what's your greatest strength? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Work on the rest of them. And then, it's a human tendency to pinpoint certain people, behaviors, or beliefs as our enemies. But we don't war against flesh and blood. Sometimes we see people that are doing things that we're like, oh, my goodness, I can't stand them. Look at the way they live. Look at the things they're doing. Look at they're a politician. What do you expect? But really, our enemies are not on the human level. What you're seeing is an outward display of a spirit. Um, in Ephesians 6 and 12, it says they are principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and principal and spiritual wickedness in high places. All of these describe the realm of evil spirits, including Satan. So that, that is where our enemy is. That is what our enemy is. It doesn't do any good to get mad at people because the people just get mad back at you. And if they've given themselves over to the devil anyway, what are you going to do? It is important to note that Paul told the Ephesians to put on the whole armor of God. They were already people of faith who'd been born again, but evidently, when you're born again, you're not born with armor on. They were faithful saints, according to Ephesians 1 and 1, but that doesn't mean they had God's armor in place because there would have been no need for him to tell them to put it on if they had it on. We should also note that we need to take the whole armor, 
Every aspect of God's armor is essential for us. It's not enough to just to put some on, ignore the rest. Well, I like that sword of the spirit, man. Well, I'm, I'm such a good swordsman with that thing. I don't need anything else. You're an idiot. We can be sure our enemy's going to strike wherever we're not protected. It's probably not best to focus only on the physical characteristics of each piece of armor mentioned. Now, we've had Bible studies and heard Bible studies, taught Bible studies on spiritual armor and spiritual warfare and stuff, and this is this and this is this and this is why and everything, but it's not necessarily so except in that scripture. It may not be helpful to try to understand why truth is connected with the loins rather than the feet. This is because Scripture doesn't always follow the same pattern. Like in Ephesians 6 and 14, we read the breastplate of righteousness. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and 8, it describes the breastplate of faith and love. But which one are you supposed to have on? How about forget about it's a breastplate. Just think about righteousness and faith and love. Uh, New Testament talks about the armor of God. Um, some of it's drawn from Isaiah 59 and 17, which tells us the Lord puts on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. But then it goes on to say he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Oh, where does that go? So rather than trying to link specific pieces of armor with the spiritual qualities it's probably best to recognize that the spiritual realities themselves are the weapons we need. And so I listed them for you. Truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation, and the word of God. Now, if Paul had been writing in our day, he may have used some current defensive and offensive weapons, but they've changed pretty, pretty rapidly. So kind of hard to keep up with those. You know. What's the F F thirty five? I think is the newest one. They've got some more stuff coming out. Generation six fighters, or I don't know. Now th those are not individual weapons. That one on one, that's one on one up there. <laughs> um, but he was still had the spiritual qualities in mind, even if he was using, you know, present day weapons. So we need to keep in mind that all of them work only in conjunction with prayer. How did, that, how did that whole scripture thing end? The sword of the spirit is included in the whole armor of God. It's the word of God, Ephesians 6 and 17. <coughs> now, this is something that I was like, I had to think over a bit and go, wow, I don't think I've seen this. You think scripture as the Word of God. Anytime somebody says the Word of God, you say, oh, we're talking about the Bible. But in the New Testament, the, word, the, the, the New Testament, while they were writing it and hadn't even written it yet, when, when Paul was there, um, a lot of this stuff was written quite a while, quite a bit later. So it was still in a state of development when, when Paul wrote this. But he finished his list of spiritual armor and weaponry with Ephesians 6 to 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So when we pray in the Spirit, we are praying the Word of God. He pointed out in Romans 8 and 26, even when we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, our prayers are groanings which cannot be uttered, and the Spirit makes intercession for us. So, now that's not to say that quoting the word from the scripture is not effective because it is. But the Old Testament is what all Paul had to go by as the word of God then. But praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit does involve praying in the spirit, speaking in tongues, when the spirit knows how to pray when you don't even know what, you're, what to pray for. It, you struggle sometimes with words. How do you... How do you put it? What exactly is needed? Well, God knows. So, we're not engaged in a part-time war. 
As long as we live, we've got to fight. Satan uses a wild range of wiles. <laughs> the, me- the word used here comes from the English word um, method. Methodea was the thing. T- he uses these kind of tricks and deceit and everything to defeat us. The meaning wor- of the Greek word means uh, includes cunning arts, deceit, craft, and trickery. But we can resist Satan and he will flee if we have submitted first to God. That's the first thing it says. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. If you're not submitted, you can resist all you want. The devil's like, just going to laugh at you. After successfully going over the horseshoe falls in a barrel on October 24th, 1901, Annie Taylor, um, the first person to try such a stunt, reportedly said nobody ought to ever do that again. And for years, nobody did. Then along came Bobby Leach, a native of Cornwall, Washington, uh, England. I'm sorry. He was a daredevil full of bravado and bravery. Stepped into the spotlight at Niagara Falls in 1906 when he parachuted into the Niagara River after jumping off the Upper Steel Arch Bridge, which was close to where the Rainbow Bridge is now. But his ultimate goal was to become the second person and the first man, since a woman did it first and beat him to it, uh, to go over Horseshoe Falls in a barrel. After a lot of delays, frustrations, and a lot of expense, he was finally ready. And I've got a picture of it for you. Tuesday, July 25th, 1911. And this barrel here with wooden bumpers at each end, he strapped into a tight harness. He was cut loose at the mouth of the Chippewa Creek at 2.55 p.m. And it was widely publicized, so there were people everywhere. They gathered at Table Rock and along the upper bank of the gorge to see if this 54-year-old man, should have known better, would actually make the attempt, and if he did, what the outcome would be. You know how people like to watch people die? What what is that about, anyway? So when his barrel was opposite the Toronto powerhouse, it struck a large rock, tearing off the front bumper. Impact was so severe, he got a large gash on his forehead. Then it made a beeline for Horseshoe Falls and went over the brink just about the center at 3.13 p.m., Now, standing with the crowd at Table Rock was a Niagara Falls, Ontario Daily Record reporter who said this, as the barrel approached the brink, the multitude of voices hushed as if by magic, and the silence at the, Niagara Falls is not too silent, was intense as the fearful plunge was made. Not a sound was heard (laughs) except for the roar of the cataract. Yeah. Dead quiet. (laughs) Okay. Until... There he is, was shouted by dozens of voices as the barrel reappeared in the seething, bubbling waters below, some little distance below the falls. Of course, the big question in everybody's mind was, did he make it? We want to see him drag a body out. You know? So just after his, his uh, barrel swept the Ottawa power plant, it got caught in an eddy and swirled around for about 20 minutes. And one of the men who worked there handed one end of a rope to a group of his fellow employees, tied the other end around his waist and jumped in. Swam out to the barrel and uh, grabbed onto it. You can see they had handles on the thing. And they pulled him back. And he was found to have, along with the gash on his forehead, two broken kneecaps, a fractured jaw, and a number of other different injuries, which resulted in him spending six months in the hospital. This is according to technology.org. I didn't make this up. For years after that, his wife and his barrel toured many parts of the world. I'm, I'm, coming, I'm, getting, to, I'm getting there. Just stay with me. Almost 15 years later, he's walking down the street in Auckland, New Zealand, slipped on an orange peel, fell, and broke his leg. Some accounts say he just injured his leg. But infection grew into gangrene, the leg was amputated, but he never recovered and died two months later. Satan doesn't want to give up on destroying us, and he'll use every opportunity to trip us up, even if it's on a, even if it's on a spiritual orange peel. After surviving death-defying acts, it's unbelievable you die from slipping on an orange peel. Death didn't beat him face-to-face in a life-or-death struggle, a dangerous event or something like that, but unprotected moment without safety measures in place. Like some of our soldiers have gone off over multiple trips to the Mideast and come back and been killed in a car wreck or something like that. It's like, what? But 
the words of Paul in Romans 13, 11 to 14 can be helpful in our effort to defeat our enemy and secure spiritual victory. And that knowing the time that it is now time, it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we, when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So, where are you in the battlefield of life today? Are you in the fight? Are you trying to hide? Look and act like the world and hope that the devil just passes you by and leaves you alone. Eh, that's probably not the way it's going to happen. Are you fighting defensively or are you fighting offensively? Are you just taking a licking and keeping on ticking? Or are you actually fighting back against the devil and trying to make him retreat? Do you have a good conscience instead of a weak conscience, a wounded conscience, a seared conscience, or an evil conscience? Are you sober and vigilant? Are you eagerly anticipating our Lord's return? Are you, or are you hoping he doesn't come back for a while? What's your attitude toward money? You know, rich people aren't the only ones obsessed with money. A lot of people who don't have it are looking for any way they can to get it. Are you content with what you have? And with what weapon do you need the most development and improvement? Truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation, the word of God? And are you certain of your salvation? If you drop dead today, where will you spend eternity? Over 50 years ago, in uh, 1967, a large medical nursing and technical team led by Christian Barnard, a surgeon, performed the world's first human-to-human human -human heart transplant, um, placing Groot Schur Hospital in Cape Town, South Africa, on the international map. The person survived only 18 days. Four of their first 10 patients survived for more than one year two of them living for 13 and 23 years. God's promise for a spiritual heart transplant was made more than 2,500 years ago. Ezekiel wrote, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Now, the word heart just doesn't mean that organ that pumps, pumps blood. But biblically speaking, it's your core being or the seat of your emotional intellectual state. Sometimes the word heart and spirit are used interchangeably. But the heart also um, associates to the whole inner man. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So unlike ever before, we need a heart for God. We need a heart to grow in Him, to stand firm for truth, and to win the spiritual warfare we're engaged in. Jesus died for us so that He could be our heart donor. So we could have life and life more abundantly. A man named Michael remember his, remember his last name. He was a stunt coordinator and a high fall specialist for Universal Studios in Florida in the early 1990s. He was part of the world record skydiving jump in 1998 in Chicago, where he linked with 246 skydivers for the largest free fall formation. They did another one after that. I think the latest one was like in 2006 with 400 over Thailand. But he was climbing the ladder on the side of a boxcar to check some rigging one day in preparation for a parachute stunt onto a train when he accidentally fell, hit his head, and was in a coma for five days and then died. His body was flown to Tucson, Arizona, where his heart was placed inside the body of Bill, who had been kept alive for the past 159 days by a 400-pound temporary artificial heart. And reading the account, this guy said he'd Laying there, anywhere he went, he had to haul this 400-pound thing down the hallway with him on rollers and was keeping his heart, keep, keeping his, not his heart, but keeping his blood pumping. And uh, he said he would, he would lay at night and watch the news. Did anybody have a car wreck? Was anybody killed? I need a heart. Kind of gruesome, really. But um, he, got, he got Michael's heart. And six months after getting his new heart, he got a letter from Michael's family with a picture of Michael. And he was surprised to find that he had the heart of a 36-year-old stuntman. 
He said, I looked at this picture and this, at this incredibly good-looking, super fit, super athletic guy, and I thought, are you kidding me? That's whose heart I've got? Before his heart transplant, he'd been a, a type A, overweight, money-obsessed businessman pursuing a jet-setter lifestyle. In his words, I was an overweight guy pursuing a wild lifestyle. I was in terrible condition. He got back in shape and began spending most of his newfound energy winning medals in swimming, cycling, and track. Ask God to give you the heart that you need to fight the good fight of faith. Ask him to give it to you, and then let him do it, because he will. You can also learn from this guy. Yeah, it wasn't the stunts that killed him. The devil will take you, and, and he will destroy you anywhere he can. It doesn't have to be in a big fight, but he will slip up behind you in the dark and, and let you die of infection. Anyway, 11.05 for service.